Good morning. Thank you, Pastor Mike. What a wonderful joy and privilege it is for me to be here and to see all of you wonderful folks here worshiping the Lord. More and more uh, lately, I'm finding myself to be the oldest person in the room. And he pointed that out for us this morning. <laughs> but, but that's okay. I would rather grow old than to die young. But uh, just to give you a little history of me, uh, I met my wife when I was 12 years old. My family had just moved from Ohio to Florida. The first week that I was there, my sister brought a young girl down from the, down the street, and she said, this is our neighbor, Annette. And when I saw her, how beautiful she was, I thought to myself, this is what I've been looking for all my life <laughs> at 12. The next week I kissed her. The next week I said, maybe we should get married. And she said, well, we're probably too young now. We should wait until we're 18. And we waited until we're 18. We're now in our 80s. I have three children, four grandchildren, and eight great-grandchildren. And uh, he mentioned some of the places that I've been, some of the accomplishments in our ministry. Uh, our greatest accomplishment, however, is to raise three children to adulthood and their children and their children who all know the Lord Jesus Christ, are baptized in the Holy Ghost, and work very regularly in the kingdom of God. And I'm so pleased about that. Big introductions don't always work in your favor. Sometimes it raises the expectation higher than it needs to be. Uh, when they read stuff like Pastor Mike did, uh, I'm thinking, oh my goodness, I, I, I can't live up to that kind of expectation. Uh, it reminds me of a proverb I learned when I was a missionary in Haiti many years ago. They speak the Creole language and have a lot of um, wonderful little proverbs. And the proverb that came to my mind while he was reading all that is one that goes like this, un trop gros nom va tuer un petit chien, which means too big a name will get a little dog killed. And so uh, <laughs> let's lower that. Uh, my name is Larry McDaniel. My wife is Annette. I wish she could be with us today. But uh, she is at our home church in Savannah, Georgia, worshiping with our family there today. My son is the pastor there. My grandson uh, is the minister of music there. My uh, daughter is the director of our daycare center. Kind of a family thing. You've probably seen churches like that. <laughs> um, several years ago, while I was uh, pastoring our church, um, a good friend of mine invited me to come to Los Angeles, California and preach at a homeless shelter. His name was James Lewis. The homeless shelter was the Los Angeles Mission, which is the largest and most prestigious uh, uh, gospel rescue mission in the world. I went there and preached for him several times. The last time I was there, he said to me, Larry, why don't you go back home to Savannah and pray about opening a gospel rescue shelter there? And I was sitting in a building that cost $35 million to build when he said that. Had a budget of over $30 million a year. Every day he's entertaining movie stars and, and politicians. And I'm thinking, I pastor a little church in Savannah, Georgia. How could I ever do anything like that? He said, well, just pray about it. The very next Sunday when I'd finished preaching, a lady in my church walked up to me. And she said, Pastor, do you know what I do for a living? I said, no, I'm, I'm sorry, I don't. She said, I'm in the mortgage business. She said, I have just foreclosed on an old apartment house downtown Savannah on 37th Street or 38th Street. And she said, the Lord spoke to me today and said, just give it to the church if you can use it for some ministry. I went down and looked at it. It was all boarded up. It was a crack house. Even though it was boarded up, people were there sleeping at night and smoking crack and doing God knows what. I'm a police chaplain in Savannah, Georgia, and from my association with the Savannah Police Department, I knew that was the number one crime block in Savannah. Not only that, it was the number one murder district in Savannah. I took some of the deacons from our church down and we pulled the boards off and cleaned the building up. My son and his wife moved into an apartment upstairs and we started ministry there 27 years ago. After doing ministry there for uh, several months, a gentleman came by one day and said, what do you all do here? And I said, well, we're holding Bible study and sharing the gospel with homeless people and hurting people. He said, do you have a lot of people coming? I said, no, almost nobody. He said, Pastor, if you want people to come, you've got to give them something to eat. 
And I said, well, we don't have anything to give them. He said, I'm a retired grocery man. I've just closed my grocery store, run a grocery store in this part of town for the last 50 years, and I know every grocery man in this county. If you will let me, I will go around and I'll collect up groceries, stuff that's nearing its expiration date, dented cans, milk that's getting close to expiring, wilted lettuce, whatever. All you got to do is just make some little flyers and put them on the street and tell anybody that comes to Bible study, you'll give them something to eat. We put the flyers on the street and the people began to come and they're still coming. After two years there, we outgrew that facility and we bought a new facility which takes up an entire city block. Your pastor has been there and with me and, and toured that and know what we do there. It is a full-fledged church. It is a church of God, by the way. They're having church there this morning. We have church every day, twice a day. We have a, a service at noon and one in the evening. We give an opportunity for people to find Christ as their personal Savior and to have emergency shelter. We have over 100 men every night that sleep in our facilities, and we give them that opportunity to accept Christ. Or if they want to get off of the street to get in our, our drug and alcohol recovery program, which is a 13-month program. We've been doing that for 27 years, and I can tell you right now we have hundreds and hundreds of men all around Savannah, Georgia, that used to be crack addicts and meth addicts, sleep under our bridges and eat out of garbage cans that are now clean and sober and working with their family. <clears throat> Though I have served as a missionary in numbers of countries and pastored numbers of churches, this is the closest thing to New Testament evangelism that I've ever been a part of. And I'm so glad your pastor came to see us there and invited me to come down here today and share a little bit with you about what we're doing. Our next project there is to create a, a women's shelter. In Savannah, Georgia, we have more homeless women than we do men. Uh, you don't see them like you see the men. They're not out panhandling, they're hiding. Women are homeless for a different reason than men. Men are homeless because of really bad and stupid choices that they've made. Women are homeless because of something that's been done to them almost always by a man, a dad, a stepdad, a boyfriend, or a, or a husband. Most of them have been raped, most of them have been beaten, and they live in abandoned buildings, they sleep in cars and abandoned buses, they bathe in convenience store restrooms. Many of them have children. In Chatham County, which is where Savannah is, we're told that there are over 800 children enrolled in Chatham County schools that have no residence, have no home, they're living with their mothers in cars or abandoned buildings. That's our next project, and maybe I will tell you more about that at the conclusion of the message. Right now, if you have your Bible with you, would you say amen? amen. If you don't, would you say, oh, me? Oh, thank the Lord. Everybody's got a Bible. Would you stand with me just a moment, please, for the reading of God's Word? And I will try to be as brief as possible and get through the message that the Lord has laid on my heart. I'm going to be reading from Luke's Gospel, chapter 5. From the New King James Version, Luke 5, verse 12. When you found it, say amen. amen. Of course, we have it up here on the Sky Bible so everybody can see it. Although I still love to hear the rustling of pages when I'm going through uh, the word of the Lord. And it happened when he was in a certain city that behold a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus. And he fell on his face and implored him, saying, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. And then he put out his hand and touched him, saying, I'm willing to be cleansed. Immediately the leprosy left him, and he charged him to tell no one, but go and show yourself to the priest. Make an offering for your cleansing as a testimony to them, just as Moses commanded However, the report went around concerning him all the more, and great multitudes came together to hear and to be healed by him of their infirmities. Father, anoint me to share your anointed word. May it make a difference in somebody's life today. In Jesus' mighty name I pray, amen. You may be seated, but please keep your Bibles open there to that text. <clears throat> for, for the next few minutes, I'm going to talk to you on this subject. The... Um, the contagious, everybody say the word contagious. contagious. The contagious Jesus. You know, I, I don't know if I still have them or if I gave them away. 
I, um, I, I wish I did know, but it was so long ago that I just can't remember. Actually, I'm talking about something that we called cooties back in the day. And so I see there are other old people in the audience because you responded to that. When I was growing up in school, we had this imaginary contagious disease called, called cooties. And, and if you had cooties, nobody would have anything to do with you. Ooh, he's got the, he's got the cooties. If you got cooties, there was a way to get rid of cooties, however. All you had to do is slip up behind somebody that didn't have cooties, and you just, you just touched them, and miraculously, the cooties went out of you and, and into them. But, but that's very difficult to do, because if they knew you had cooties, they wouldn't let you get anywhere near them. They would, they would run from you. I found the best way to do that is just wait until class is about to start. Just as the bell rings, I would walk in and touch the guy in front of me and say, guess what? Now you got the cooties. Well, that, that's kind of a, a silly little thing, but maybe it, it, uh, it programmed our minds to be aware of something that is contagious. Well, we got all kind of contagious stuff going around today. I remember back in 2008, there was a, a swine flu. Way before COVID, uh, swine flu came and and people were dying of that all over the world. And the Centers for Disease Control, they would take, a, take these little uh, uh, commercials they'd put on television, public service announcements, and tell us to wash our hands often. They would say, Rush, wash your hands with soap under running water as long as it takes you to sing happy birthday or twinkle, twinkle, little star. And so we all became aware of this contagiousness and we washed our hands regularly. Now, with COVID and other diseases that we have today, we're still aware of that. And, and we're, all of us are used to pumping that goo on our hands, especially if you go into a place like like a hospital. Hospitals are dangerous places. My wife had a hip replacement surgery a number of years ago. And after the surgery, the doctor came in and to tell me that she uh, did well in the, in the surgery. And I said, doctor, how, how, many, um, how many weeks will she have to stay here in the hospital? He said, oh my goodness. I said, I will get her up. She will walk on this new hip today and she's going to go home tomorrow. I said, you're going to send her out of this hospital tomorrow after a hip replacement? He said, oh, yeah. He said, there's infection in this hospital. I don't want her here any longer than she has to be. And I was aware, hey, I wash my hands when I go to the hospital. When I go to a hospital room, I put that goo on my hands and cleanse my hands. And when I go back to the elevator, I just touch that elevator button with my elbow and I wash my hands. I was on a cruise ship recently. How many ever been on a cruise ship recently? You got that uh, uh, wishy-washy uh, ninja girl that tells everybody, washy-washy your hands before you eat. And we're all aware of that because of the danger of, of infection. It's out there and it's, um, and, and it's real. But I'm going to talk to you about an infection so long ago that was extremely contagious, but it might have something to speak to your life and my life today. It is the um, disease of, of leprosy. And here in God's Word, we find the story of a man who was a, a leper. There's several things about him that I want to share with you in the next 15 to 20 minutes that may have an effect on, on your life. Leprosy was a, a horrible disease that was highly contagious. If you got it, you were going to be an outcast for the rest of your life, and there was no way for you to get rid of it. It was terminal. It would take its toll on your life, but it would take many, many years to do it. And here in this story, we have the story of a man who was a, a leprous man. Several things I want you to notice about him. Number one, he is introduced in Scripture to us without a name. Look in the Bible again in verse 12. The Bible said it didn't happen when he was in a certain city that behold, a man who was full of of leprosy, a man who was full uh, of leprosy. Now that means the leprosy was full blown. He, he didn't, didn't just get this. He's had it for many, many years. Now the Bible doesn't give us any history of how this man got it, but it started with a small lesion somewhere on his body. It probably nearly scared the life out of him when he first realized that, that he had it. Um, but he knew once he had it, uh, it was going to take a toll on his life. As a matter of fact, back in those days, if you got leprosy, you were immediately an outcast. You, you were homeless. You had to move out of your house. You couldn't go in anybody else's house. You couldn't go to the synagogue. You couldn't get around where people were. 
uh, you, you, couldn't, uh, you couldn't associate with me. As a matter of fact, if you were walking down the road and people were coming, you were required by law to holler, unclean, uh, uh, unclean. Here's a man that's had it for a long time because the Bible said that he was full of leprosy. It had taken his toll so bad that the digits were falling off of his hand and, and uh, parts of his face were probably falling out. He, he was filthy. He, you could smell him a block away. A man full of leprosy came to Jesus, but the Bible doesn't tell us his name. Now, up, up until this point in time, 24 out of 25 people that came to Jesus, they were identified by name, but this man was just uh, incognito. He was anonymous. A, a man, a man full of of leprosy. Uh, we, we tend to do that today. We, we need to, we sometimes need to characterize people by the weakest and the worst thing about them. That man there, he's a, he's an old drunk. He's a, he's a homeless guy. Better stay away from that guy. I think he probably has AIDS. No telling what he's got. Oh, she's an adulterous woman. Oh, that's a homosexual over there. We identify people with the weakest and worst things about them. And this man was identified simply as a man full of of, of leprosy. Can you imagine what his life had been like since he first found it? You know, back in that day, uh, there were a lot of people who had leprosy. And uh, if you had some little lesion somewhere, a little sore somewhere on your, bo- your body, you probably wouldn't tell anybody about it. You would just kind of hope that it would go away. And most of the time it would go away. But if it didn't go away and it was leprosy, you knew that your life was condemned to live a life of loneliness and hopelessness. You would never be able to embrace your spouse again. You would never be able to pick up a child and hug and kiss your child or your grandchild. And so if it started, you just hope that that's not what it was. But if it was you know you're going to spend a horrible life. And this man has spent a horrible life up to this time, and he came to Jesus just identified um, as a man full of leprosy. Those of us that took high school literature will remember a book written by Nathaniel Hawthorne. It was called The The Scarlet Letter. It was about a young woman by the name of Prynne uh, uh, who lived in the British colony of Massachusetts, and she was compromised as a young woman and had a child out of wedlock. And the church and the community came together and said, uh, your punishment is going to be for the rest of your life, you're going to wear a scarlet letter around your neck to identify yourself as an adulteress. So she was just known for the weakest and the worst part of her life. And I deal with people on every day that are are scorned. People will walk the other way, go on the other side of the street to keep from passing them because of, that's just a homeless guy. That's an alcoholic. He's a crack addict. He's a, he's a drug addict, and we don't want to have anything to do with him. Number one, we see that this man was identified um, without a name. The second thing is that he came to Jesus, which was the best thing he ever did in his life. He came to Jesus with intensity. Verse 12 says that it happened when he was in a certain city that behold a man who was full of lepers, he saw Jesus and he, he fell on his face. He fell on his face. Now perhaps you have the idea in Bible times people are always running and falling down at somebody's feet, but that's not so. That would have been considered uh, something very uh, undignified. But this man, he, uh, he came with intensity. He had heard of Jesus and that was his last chance. That was his last hope. And so he didn't care what anybody thought about it. He just came to where Jesus was and he fell on his face. In my mind, I can see that large crowd around him. John tells us that this took place right after the Sermon on the Mount. So when this leprous man showed up, there was a huge crowd of people there. And now this man who was obviously a leper came running through the crowd. I can imagine that crowd parting like the Red Sea as this man came down. As a matter of fact, they could have stoned him for being there. It was illegal. It was against the law for him to be there. But he came at the risk of his own life because he was so intense. This is my last hope. There's nowhere else I can go. If I don't get to Jesus, I'm going to die of this horrible, dreaded condition. He came with intensity. What, what are you intense about? I, I get amazed at some of the things that people get intense about. Did you know people get intense about sporting events? Just amazing to me. Pe- people get intense about uh, celebrities. I was in Paris, France one day. 
uh, several years ago, and all of a sudden I saw a crowd, a crowd just gathered, and, and b b before I knew it, there were a hundred people or more that were crowded on the store, and I said, what, what happened there? And they said, it's because of who went in there? I said, who went in there? And they said, Paris Hilton. I don't know that Paris Hilton is famous for anything except being famous, but they, they were so intense. Pe people get intense about a sporting event. Uh, they, they will camp out uh, days before to make sure they get in there. I don't understand Black Friday, do you? Do, do you believe that people will get so intense that they will camp out in front of a Walmart store to get in there and get a bargain the day after Thanksgiving? What do you get intense about? I get intense about the work that I'm doing because I, I'm reaching people that they're at the end of the rope. They're at the end of the line. They are at the bottom. There is no lower place than they can get. And if Jesus doesn't touch them, they are going to be lost through all of eternity. This man came with <coughs> intensity. He also came with, with persistence. Verse 12, again, it happened when he was in certain cities that behold a man who was full of leprosy saw Jesus and he fell on his face, fell on his face and he implored him. Implored is a, a good word. That's, that's not a word that I use very often. Luke uses the word implored a, a lot. Uh, for, for example, when, when Jesus delivered the moniac of the Gadarenes and the demons went out of him, the Bible said that the demons implored Jesus, don't leave us out here, let us go into the swine. Remember the lunatic who had the son that fell in the fire and in the water? He, he implored him, said, Master, I, I brought him to your disciples and they couldn't do anything. Please, if you don't help him, Lord, uh, he has no chance whatsoever. And so this man came with a, a persistence and said, Lord, you're my last chance. If you don't help me, there's nothing else that I can do. Fourth thing I want you to notice is this man saw saw Jesus. Look again in verse 12, and it happened when he was in a certain city that behold, a man who was full of leprosy, he saw Jesus. Well, of course he saw Jesus. He was standing right there. There was a multitude of people there and they all, they all saw Jesus, but not everybody that's looking at him actually sees him. This man, he saw Jesus. He Locked his eyes on Jesus. And you know what I believe? I believe at that same moment, Jesus was looking back at him. You know, I, I'm, I understand that Jesus is the most looked at person in all of human history. Everybody thinks they know what the, what the face of Jesus is supposed to look like. You know, then billions of Catholics see him on crucifixes and millions of Christians see him in our Christian literature and we see him in encyclopedias and in museums around the world. We see him, but we really don't see him. He's the most looked at person, but we still haven't turned our eyes toward him and locked in to the face of Jesus. But this man in that crowd, when he saw Jesus standing there, he locked his vision with Jesus. I, I was in Paris, France not long ago and I went to him cathedral there that sits up on a hill way up above Paris, overlooking Paris. It's called the Cathedral of the Basilica of the Sacred Cur, the Sacred Heart. And there is a portrait of Jesus that is made in, in little tiny pieces of mosaic tile, and it fills the back of that church in its shoes. And I'm told it's the largest portrait of Jesus in the world, and it's fascinating to look at it. And I'd heard about this, and I actually tried it out the last time I was there. No matter where you sit in that church and you look at Jesus, the way the artist designed that, he's looking right at you. And you move, and I went over to the far right of the cathedral, and I sat down, and Jesus is looking right at me. And I went all the way to the other side, and he was looking right up at me. I was in the back. He saw me. I walked all the way down to the front, and he was looking right at me. This man locked his eyes with Jesus. You remember the little course we sang a few years ago, Turn Your Eyes? Upon Jesus, look full into his wonderful, his marvelous face. Have you really done that lately? Have you locked in with Jesus Christ and know that not only do I see him, but, but he sees me. Oh, it's like a little man up in the tree in Jericho. You remember the guy up there? Jesus looked up in the trees and he thought, hey, he sees me. Not only does he see me, but he, he knows me. Not only does he see me, not only does he know me, he wants me to come down, he said, Zacchaeus. I want to go to your house. This man locked his eyes 
in Jesus Christ. And I believe the moment he locked his eyes on Jesus, he knew it's going to be, it's going to be all right. So he comes to Jesus, he falls on his face, and he comes with a question. Here's the question. Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. You know, that, that's a question and a statement, kind of a half-truth and a half-untruth. Lord, if you're willing, that was the question. Here's the statement. You can make me clean. You're going to learn that not only was Jesus able, but Jesus is willing to radically transform his life, restore him to perfect health. You know, we look at, at the Bible and we see all the things that Jesus did in the Bible. And we say, well, yeah, that was way back then. That was, that was then. We see what the Lord has done for other people. We say, well, yeah, that was them, but, but this is me. I, I know he's healed others of cancer, but this is me. This is my cancer. Can he, can he heal mine? I know he's delivered somebody else's boy from drugs, but that's my boy. What, what, what can he do for me? Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. He, he could have said that other way. If you're able, Lord, but he got it right. Lord, you are able. Lord, if you're willing... You can make me clean. You know what we've got to do? We've got to learn to personalize Jesus. What he'll do for others, he'll do for you. What he did way back then, he's still doing it now. Lord, we know you can, and Lord, we believe you will. It's my time for a miracle. Lord, do it for me, and do it right now. I love to sing the songs of the great blind songwriter, uh, Fanny Crosby, who wrote Blessed Assurance. I like the chorus where she says, this is my story. This is my song. Would have had near the impact if she had said, this is somebody's story. This is somebody's song. But she said, no, this is my story. This is my song. Serving my son. David said, the Lord is not just a shepherd. He's not just a good shepherd, but the Lord is, is my shepherd. What he does for others, he will do for me. This little man got it right. He got it right. And then the final thing I want to show you this. Not only comes with a question, he came for a touch. And he got a touch. Hallelujah. This is what I call an audible gasp moment. Here was that crowd. They, they saw this leprous man, this horrible old leprous man. And, and, and by the way, I, I see this at the old Savannah City Mission all the time. I see people come to, to visit us and they see the people that come in at noon or at 7 o'clock and they kind of give them a wide berth. Don't want to get too close to them. Afraid that something on them is going to get off on them. And here this man comes, the leprous man, and they're thinking the very idea, this low down, sorry, leprous man would, would come in this place. And now he's come right up to Jesus. Jesus, be careful. Don't get close to him, Jesus. If you touch him, Lord, you're going to be unclean. If you get around him, whatever's in him is going to get in you. But I can see that crowd as Jesus stretches forth his hand toward that man. Those people, surely not. Jesus, you're not going to touch him. All of a sudden, Jesus touches him. There had to be an audible gasp. <gasps> like those YouTube videos when the little child falls into the gorilla pit. <gasps> like you're watching an NFL game and that little running back is running as hard as he can go and that defensive guy comes and they hit, bam! And you can hear the smack of it all the way up into the top. <gasps> Jesus. You're not going to touch him. But it touched him. 
But let me tell you something about the touch of Jesus. When Jesus touches a greedy person, that greed does not go into Jesus. When Jesus touches a lazy person, that laziness does not come into Jesus. When he touches an adulterous person, that adulterousness does not come into Jesus. Jesus is more contagious than the leprosy. Jesus is more contagious than the sin of a dope addict, a crack addict. Jesus is more contagious than anything, and whatever he touches, he changes it for the good. And I'm seeing that happen on a daily basis. Let me end with this. In Argentina, on July the 25th, 2013, a young mother by the name of Analia Buter gave birth to a premature baby that weighed less than a pound. I want you to Google what I'm telling you to know that it is the truth. Analia Buter, June 25, 2013. The baby was dead. The attendants of the hospital picked up that baby. They put it in a little wooden coffin they had for such things as that, took it to the basement of that hospital and put it in a cooler and closed the door. Two hours later, as his mother was coming out of the stupor of her sedation, she said, oh, where's my baby? And they said, we're sorry, your, your baby your baby didn't make it. Your, your baby is dead. Well, can I just see her? Well, she's already in the morgue. But would you just go get her? I want, I want to hold my baby. More than two hours had passed. They got that baby and they brought it to that girl and laid that baby on her chest. And she put the mother's touch hands on that baby. And all of a sudden, a little leg began to quiver. A little arm began to move. And the baby began to breathe. A few days later, she took that baby home with her. Oh, the power of touch. The contagiousness of Jesus that can touch anybody. No matter how lost in sin. And bring hope and life and wholeness one more time in Jesus name Father thank you for letting me have the privilege to share this little message with this congregation this morning Lord, let us understand that you can still make the leper clean you can take those that are lost in sin the depths of sin bring them back in wholeness and fill them with your spirit in Jesus name I pray amen our pastor is going to come let me just tell you the next thing that we're going to do at the Old Savannah City Mission. We are. Thank you for joining us online today from wherever you are watching in the world. Hey, if you gave your life to Christ today, please let us know in the comments. Our online team will reach out to you with a link. Uh, and not